Hello, and welcome to this eSchool News webcast. My name is Andrew Barber, Senior Contributing Editor, and I'll be acting as the moderator for today's presentation, which is sponsored by Barracuda Network. It's titled, Protect Students, Secure Data. Before I introduce our speakers, I just want to take a few moments to highlight a couple of items. First, today's event will be recorded. Um, so in a couple of days, you'll get an email from us containing a link to the recorded event. And if you want, you can also, at that point, download a PDF of the presentation. And second, please do ask questions. Don't feel as if you have to wait until the end. At any time during the presentation, if you have a question, just type it into the Q&A box on your console and hit the Submit button. I hope we'll have five, maybe 10 minutes at the end when our speakers can answer your questions. We do have a chat function as well, which can be launched via the brown group chat icon at the bottom of your screen. Use chat to talk among yourselves or to contact me or the school news team with any technical issues or concerns. However, please don't use the chat function to ask the speakers questions. They, they just won't have time to monitor the chat. If you have a question, please use the Q&A panel instead. With that out of the way, let me introduce today's speakers. Jennifer Braun is Education Marketing Manager at Barracuda Network. She oversees the company's K-12 marketing strategy and program. She has more than 20 years of high-tech marketing experience, expertise, with a background in vertical marketing for the K-12, higher education, and healthcare industry. Our second speaker, Daniel Korsunski, is a security product marketing manager at Barracuda Network. Daniel manages Barracuda's total threat protection solution, as well as the entire network security product offering, including solutions such as Barracuda's application delivery network. With nine years of experience in the security industry, Daniel has focused primarily on product marketing and electrical engineering, with an emphasis on robotics and military technology. Welcome, Jennifer and Daniel. It's an honor to have you here today. And Jennifer, why don't you get us started? Great. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks for that great introduction. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. So I want to talk just a moment about Barracuda Networks. So we primarily focus on a mid-market segment, which is really 500 to 5,000 users in size. So what we're seeing today with our K-12 customers is that a lot of the schools we're working with have over 5,000 students, but they really are running into the same constraints as our customers in the mid-market. And these are really resource constraints, budget constraints, and staff constraints. And what we find is, you know, K-12 is not like a major company. They don't have that large IT staff. And what you're finding is that a staff of a few people or even just one person who really has to manage anything from figuring out how to secure the network to being that help desk for the teachers. And that really brings us to the title of this slide of you know, why every school needs a hero. You know, every school needs that IT hero. And I'm actually going to turn it over really quickly here to Daniel, and he's going to spend just a few minutes um, talking to you about the total threat protection. Great. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. I think in this day and age, I think all of us are pretty well aware that we need to secure the threat vectors, no longer focusing on the threats. We're constantly battling an uphill battle where threats are always evolving, but threat vectors have not changed over the last few decades. So the importance of creating a solution and an architecture across your school organization by securing the network perimeter with next generation firewalls focusing on reducing attacks uh, born through spam by securing your email exchange, or protecting your students, uh, your web applications, the remote users, and most of all, the mobile devices. We know in today's day and age that it's imperative to secure the threat vectors versus the threat. Using a simple analogy is, you know, you wouldn't leave on vacation and lock your front door but leave your garage door open. So why take that advocacy position with your security policy? In today's day and age, hackers don't go after a 1024-bit encryption. 
They go for the path of least resistance, which usually occurs from one threat vector being unprotected, creating a linear path of vulnerability. So it's even more important now that we focus on securing each individual threat vector to create a security posture that keeps our users, our data, our environments safe from attack or malicious harm, whether it's caused internally or externally. The information on the screen is provided by Verizon's Data Breach Investigation Report. In previous years, this report highlighted that point-of-sale intrusions were the number one breach that occurred. As the adoption of web applications has become more prominent, given the use of social media sites, Google for search, and really in today's day and age, there's no longer such a thing as a static website. Everything is a form of a web application. Verizon puts this report together across 5,000 different organizations in over 100 different countries. Organizations like Barracuda, the Secret Service, Palo Alto Networks all contribute data to this report, which focuses on the highest breach vectors. And the numbers highlighted here, actually we've seen a shift where web application attacks have actually become the number one breach based on over 1,600 varying breaches that were analyzed based on where data was actually stolen and removed from large, small organizations, uh, educational institutions, pretty much you name it. The information on the screen provided is a, one of my favorite websites, actually. This organization designs web exploitation kits. This is called Fragus. The scary thing about this is these exploits are easy to procure. There's no expertise required, which means no longer do you have to be a black hat hacker, computer science major, an MIT graduate. You could be an adolescent in middle school or high school that saved up his lunch money and procured one of these. These exploits cost $250, and it's completely legal for these organizations to actually sell them because it's not the technology that's illegal, it's what you do with it. What's even scarier about this is these attacks are non-discriminatory. They do not care whether you're a large Fortune 500 organization or a private educational institution. They attack thousands of servers in just seconds, meaning everybody really is at risk. I'm going to turn it over to Jen Braun, and she's going to take a dive into the technology trends in education today. All right, great. Thanks, Daniel. So we're just going to jump right in here and talk about the first trend, which is mobility. So we know that there are so many mobile devices now coming on and off campus that really makes your network perimeter borderless. So, you know, if we looked at 10 or 15 years ago, um, we know that your network would have contained, you know, servers, users, and computers. And if I asked you to draw me a diagram of what that looked like, you'd put those all on a piece of paper and then you'd draw this box around it, which would be your uh, network perimeter. But today, it just has changed, and really that perimeter no longer exists in making that borderless. And with that comes a lot of challenges, and we have to ensure that uh, we have the same security policy in place for everything that's on the network. Well, it has to apply to everything that's going off network as well. So, for example, if a student goes to Starbucks and they want to use the free Wi-Fi with that Chromebook you issued, you really need to make sure that you're ensuring their security because at the end of the day, that's still school property. And then we also have the challenge of just being able to manage to SIPA compliance, which I think a lot of us are familiar with. You know, that's you know, making sure those students have a good browsing experience, whether they're on or off the network. And we have to ensure that's a safe browsing experience. And then there's also Wi-Fi on campus. And there's really a feel now from schools and districts that there's a need to give free Wi-Fi to support all these devices that are coming on and off campus. And again, you have to make sure you can secure those and manage them. And so let's talk really quickly just you know, how we can do that. And first, let's talk about the one-to-one -one initiative piece. And the solution is to install remote agents for PCs, Macs, Windows tablets. And we have what's called the web security agent. 
And this is a lightweight, tamper-proof software, and it's an endpoint client that goes on an endpoint device. And what's nice is the students, they can't log off of it and they can't shut it down. And then we also look at Chromebooks. And we know these aren't your traditional laptop. They're web-based OS. You only have a web browser, so you can't install agents. But what you can do is you can proxy traffic back to a web filter. And this is going to give you visibility into you know, where people are going, who's using it, et cetera. And then lastly, mobile devices. And we're talking you know, iOS, Android devices, things that you're really supporting probably around a one-to-one -one initiative. And, and there's two, two ways to look at this. One, you could have safe browsing via Safari. You can lock the browser app down and push a safe browsing instead. And there's no proxy settings or VPN setup required. And what's happening is with all provision back to a web filter. And then we also have uh, launched recently a mobile device manager, MDM. And it's a cloud-based service and where you can enroll, activate, and provision your devices. And you are able to push your payloads, proxy settings, the web safe browsers, and other Barracuda applications. And the second piece that really makes uh, mobility challenging is being able to track the activity of the users, whether they're, they're on or off campus. And there's that need for visibility. And so all the remote agents that I mentioned earlier, they'll allow you to keep track of these devices, know the location, know what sites the students are browsing and for how long. And the really nice thing about it is that everything is centrally managed in one interface. And everything that we've talked about so far and the, regarding the Romo agents and the MDM, they are unlimited and free from Barracuda. And in fact, with the MDM, you don't even need to own a Barracuda product. You can just get signed up for that and start working with that tool. So the second piece I want to talk to you about is the Wi-Fi on campus. So with more and more devices coming onto the campus, we know that there's been a need to offer the free Wi-Fi. But the challenge here is that those devices that come onto your network don't authenticate. So you really have no idea who's on that device. And so our web filter integrates with a number of wireless access points. And you can see the companies listed here, for example, Maroon Networks, Ruckus Wireless, Arrowhive. And what happens is that you're going to, this is going to allow you more granular visibility. So you'll know who the user was, what device they were using. And so now if the student gets onto your Wi-Fi, it's going to take that same authentication data that you used to jump on and it will push it to the web filter. So now you'll have that same level of user identity and visibility into the traffic. So let's jump over to another trend that we're seeing, which is assessment readiness. And I think everyone is, uh, knows a lot about this as we you know, start talking about online testing. And there's really one big main challenge around this, and that is managing your capacity and bandwidth for all those online testing standards and initiatives that you have to implement. And we can look at you know, examples such as PARC and Smarter Balance Assessment Consortium. We know that there, these things will require a lot of bandwidth. But in addition to the uh, online testing, there's a lot of multimedia sites that are also going to drive up your requirements for increased availability. So things like YouTube for schools or teachers wanting to use curriculum with Khan Academy, these items, these solutions just drive up the amount of bandwidth consumption being used in your network. And then there's also social media sites, that user-generated content, which is really rich in images and videos. And those also will drive up that, those availability requirements as well. And then, as I mentioned before, there's PARC. And actually with PARC, they really have a need for you to allocate a specific amount of bandwidth. So this year, they're asking for 100 megabits per thousand students. But two years from now, it's going to be one gigabit per thousand students. And so there's a lot of changes that we're talking about when it comes to network availability and capacity. So you really have to start thinking if you're going to have things uh, impacted, are you going to need to be thinking about firewall upgrades or your web proxy infrastructure? Can it support these things? 
The interesting uh, question that came out from a survey of recent, are you prepared for online assessments? And so what's interesting is that only three out of 10 IT district leaders are saying they have full readiness. And so that's really telling us that there is a need to be able to, to assess what uh, the network capacity. So there's also a set of challenges that come with migrating to online assessment platforms. And you can really manage these things two ways. There's a software side to manage them, and there's a hardware side. So if we look at on the software side, we, you know, there's a better way to manage policies. And we want to think about layer seven, seven visibility for more granular control. So schools are dealing with things like UltraSurf or BitTorrent. You know, these are peer-to-peer -peer file sharing apps or anonymous proxies, and they choke up a lot of bandwidth. So you want to be able to set policies that will allow you to either block some of that traffic or all of that traffic. Because you, at the end of the day, you're going to need to keep more bandwidth for the, the other stuff, for these online testing requirements. But the software will only get you so far. And what you really need to look at is bigger and better hardware. And that's where Barracuda, we have our Barracuda web filter and the Barracuda Next Generation Firewall. And we've been supporting customers such as Dysart and Cherry Hill who have 10,000 to 30,000 students. We also su have supported environments that are virtual such as the Peninsula Cyber Charter. And there's no brick or mortar. They are using a cloud-based web filtering solution. So it's really a lot of flexibility here, you know, whether you have a physical network, a virtual network, or a cloud-based network. So now we're going to move on and talk to, about the cloud. So speaking of the cloud, let's talk about cloud migration. So what we're seeing today are that many of our customers, many schools, they're moving to cloud-based or SaaS apps. And the biggest challenge here is securing that proper amount of Internet connectivity and available bandwidth. <clears throat> and so we're really talking about a similar challenge to what we were looking at with online assessments. And then we also have to make sure that the privacy of this data is secure. And, you know, for example, you don't want students' grades to get hacked, the student's not going to be happy about it, and they are the parents or the district. And so you really have to secure their data. And then as we see the move from the traditional on-premise network to SaaS and cloud-based uh, usage, you're also going to see an increase in the tax surface. And so you're going to have to think about how you're going to secure that. And then lastly, there is a steep learning curve that you're going to have to go and re-educate your users, your students, and your teachers. So another question, another stat that came out recently that was asked is which cloud-based solutions have the highest adoption rate? And what we're seeing and what they said from IT group was 65% of K-12 organizations are using online productivity tools such as Google Docs or Office 365. And what that's telling us is that this, this isn't a flash in the pan. These things are here to stay. And really for the IT staff, what that means is that when you're using cloud-based applications, in you know, SaaS-based applications that, you know, they're easier to manage, there's less maintenance, and there's less overhead. But as you move to the cloud, it really changes how networks are designed. So if we look at this uh, on-premise you know, network, um, you know, we could call it of the past, but, uh, you know, you're looking at a single point of egress. Because everything, your servers, the, all, all of those items, they're all in one location. So if you were to add a school, you build a new middle school, what you're really doing is you're just adding a site-to-site -site VPN. And so with that one single point of egress, you need one big firewall and one big web proxy infrastructure in front of that single point of egress. And then everything is backhauled. So you're backhauling everything on the local side of the network. And you know, that makes it easy to manage policies and enforce security settings. 
But now we know that there's a lot of resources in the cloud. Schools are using Office 365 and Google Apps. We have students who love to use Dropbox or take notes in class with their laptop using Evernote. You have teachers using apps such as Blackboard and LearnBoost. And now with all these things in the cloud, there's no need to backhaul all that traffic. But what happens is you have to re-architect your network. So there's no more piping everything back to one place. You have these multiple points of egress. And what that means is that every location now is going to have its own firewall. And the challenge with that is that you have, a manage, you have to manage how you're going to distribute your firewall architecture. So if you have 20 firewalls, you need to push settings out to all 20. We don't have to do it one at a time. You want to be able to do it all at once. And that's exactly what the NG firewall does. And I'm going to hand it back to Daniel here just for a moment and you can speak to this. Yeah, so as Jennifer mentioned, that in today's day and age, it's not just enough to have a solution that creates security, but also improves your actual network topology. And looking at Barracuda's next generation firewalls, we enhance uh, educational institutions' ability to create a sca uh, scalable, centralized management environment, environment where you can manage multiple distributed firewalls off of one centralized uh, NG control center. And because we need to create a high availability model, link over fail balancing and redundancy is incredibly important, especially when you're looking at a sufficient amount of students taking assessments in one given time. You need to create an environment that if one path fails, it will always redirect and create a constant momentum without hindering uh, continuity. Most of all, every school has different seasons in it, whether you're talking about park assessment or normal day-to-day -day operation. Network traffic prioritization is key and application link base selections is even more important. How do you create policies that allow you to uh, keep your mission critical applications running smoothly and fluently while you have an influx of high throughput and users accessing uh, one environment? With our next generation firewalls, you're able to prioritize specific applications that are mission critical while keeping your students safe by limiting exposure uh, to varying other websites that they should not be browsing. Most of all, with this latest release, the NG uh, 6.1 firewall also incorporates uh, YouTube for schools for e-learning and allows you to make sure the right applications are available to your students, give you real granular visibility into Layer 7 application traffic. Uh, making your administrators aware of what exactly is going on in the environment and how to better mitigate risk and issues that can occur through an influx of traffic or users at any given time. Great. Thanks, Daniel. All right, so we're going to move on to our next trend, which is safe learning. And I think the challenges are pretty clear here. So we know as curriculum and other materials go digital and online that we have to figure out a way to manage the online student safety. And then we also have to make sure that we are in good standing with SIPA. And really the results of these first two challenges bring up the third one, that lack of workflow between teachers and the IT department. And what I mean by this is that there becomes, IT gets a little bit overbearing sometimes on the content that teachers can use because they're erring on the side of blocking. And that's leaving teachers waiting for uh, things to be whitelisted, et cetera. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. And then there's just this challenge of a paper overload pro problem where you have parents needing to sign so many things and uh, getting it back between the school and the home. And, and I'll come back to that as well. So let's uh, talk a moment about online student safety. So with the increased amount of activity and the user-generated content from social media, from things such as Facebook or Twitter and Instagram, we know that also brings about more cyberbullying, suspicious behavior, inappropriate behavior. And, and so an IT department or school, you know, you have to think about, do I open up Facebook or not? And the challenge here is that most of this traffic is secure. 
we find that 40% of all web traffic is SSL encrypted. And so it really becomes difficult to have visibility into it. And then on top of it, you just need to be able to do your regular job, you know, not getting the network infected and protecting it from malware or spyware that maybe a teacher or a student you know, has accidentally downloaded. So let's talk about SSL scanning for a moment. So like I said earlier, 40% of this traffic now is encrypted. And so what you're going to need is a web proxy infrastructure that's going to allow you to decrypt this traffic. Because at the end of the day, you want to be able to enforce granular policies on things like Facebook and YouTube and, and Google, et cetera. And so with Barracuda, with social media with Barracuda, the first thing you can do is get very granular. So it's not a block all, you know, or allow all policy. So if we look at Facebook, for example, you can allow Facebook, but you might want to block the chat and you might want to block the games. And so we allow you that freedom and flexibility to do that and to set those right policies that work for your school. And then there's suspicious activity alerts that you can also set. So we have triggers that we always already predefine, you know, certain keywords such as, you know, what around guns, violence, cyberbullying, etc. But then you also have the ability to insert your own keywords because you're going to know, you know, better, even that, you know, better than us, what uh, what you need to look for. And all of these um, items, they integrate. So our web filter integrates with another product we have, which is called the Barracuda Message Archiver. And the archiver allows you to automatically archive all this information. So you can archive your your emails, your social media emails. And what that allows you to do is have that ready in case something comes up and you know something legal, so you have it ready for future e-discovery uh, compliance regulation. So speaking of compliance, so we know you know SIP has come up a few times. There's this set of rules you need to follow. It's nothing new. And so at Barracuda, what what we'll allow you you be able to do is enforce state search policies on things like YouTube for schools and Google, Yahoo. And all the major search engines have that safe search portal. And so what we can do is automatically enforce the redirect of all your traffic to those safe search portals. So let's move over and talk about that other challenge, that inefficiencies of the workflow between the teacher and the IT department. And just to give you an idea and a sense of what, uh, what we're talking about here is, so we know it takes 24 hours. That's about the amount of time that the average help desk, desk ticket gets resolved. And remembering that most of our IT uh, staff is a staff of one, and that 80% of these IT tickets or help tickets, they're all related to whitelisting. And so, you know, for example, if a teacher wants to teach anatomy course or, you know, session in their biology and they go to the site that they want to access but it comes up as blocked because it's marked as porn, they have to put that ticket in and are waiting 24 hours to get it whitelisted. So what happens is the teacher's waiting and they may not, if they weren't proactive, maybe they didn't get to teach that class that day. So the solution, the answer that we have to that is what are called temporary access tokens. And these really eliminate that workflow issue. And this is a feature on our web filter. And what happens is a teacher is now able to go to that site, and they know it's blocked, so they can go and generate a random token. That's then they'll put the token in, and then they can get to the site to go and teach that lesson they were planning to teach. And the IT department sets up the permissions and the rules around those tokens. So for example, you can set like which sites, you know, which teachers have access to those sites, and even how long they have access. So if it's a one hour class, you have, give them access for one hour. And then there's ability just to have content that's always blocked, like sites that you would never want whitelisted. Like for example, you would never whitelist playboy.com. So you just always have that blocked. And so no one can access it by a token. And this was a feature that Barracuda, we really had K-12 in mind when we designed this feature on the web filter. 
So the, the last item I want to talk to you about in the safe learning uh, trend section is moving to a paperless school. So on average, we're seeing that there's about 11,000 signatures that are going through a school in any given school year. I mean, these are things such as permission slips, um, it could be signing off on a report card, social media use policies. And so Barracuda has a product that's called CUDA Sign, formally Sign Now. And what that is, what it is, I should say, is our e-signature solution. And it allows you to track and manage all these doc documents electronically. So for example, you would send, the teachers need to sign off on a permission script for the kids' field trip. You send it electronically to their email. They're through CUDA Sign. They can go in, sign that permission slip on their mobile app, send it back, and then the teacher or the administration office, whomever, can you know keep track of you know what's been sent, who's signed it, um, and you have a full audit trail. So you really, it's no more you know getting did the kid put that thing in his backpack and bring it back to school. You have full control over that. And one of the nice things is that you can deploy and manage CUDA sign on the MDM, the mobile device manager that I told you about earlier. So finally, we're going to talk about the importance around protecting student data. And as we see you know, more and more data is being generated, and that there is a need to back it up. And, and when we're talking about things, it mean, could be immunization records, student grades, there's just a lot of information out there now. And there's also a lot of sensitive data. And you don't want you know, to lose that data, or you don't want it to be stolen either. So, so whether your resources you know, are you know, physical or, or in the cloud, you have to think of how you're going to back up your data efficiently. And, and with that, um, we have the Barracuda Backup which is an on-premise appliance. And so now you can send your file information on-premise, but we also integrate into a Barracuda Backup Cloud. So you can have your information sit locally on the backup appliance, where it will replicate disk to disk to another site, another location, or you can go disk to cloud, and you can store everything in the secure <coughs> Barracuda Public Cloud. So with that, that covers the trend section. I'm going to hand it back over to Daniel, and he's going to spend some time talking to you about total threat protection. Daniel? Great. Thanks, Jennifer. So as we discussed earlier, in today's day and age, it's imperative to focus on securing your threat vectors versus just the threat alone. So when Barracuda focused on becoming a solution organization, creating best of breed products that integrated from one to the next to secure each individual vector, we came up with a methodology called total threat protection. So looking at varying network architecture solutions, Organizations really had, you know, in the past two options. You go with a multi-vendor point solution approach, which is great for some organizations, for some universities, because you get to deploy best-in-class products that are powerful and scalable to secure each individual vector, utilizing best-of-breed companies like Barracuda, Cisco, Palo Alto Networks. On the other side of the spectrum, you have an all-in-one solution. And typically we see organizations and universities that typically tend to be smaller. And they go to this solution because it's easier to use. It comes off as more affordable and it's unified. You're managing multiple threat vectors from one common interface. Both solutions are great because the truth is in today's environment there is no one size fits all model because all network topology varies and specific use cases change. So the importance of focusing on what you're trying to achieve, what you're trying to limit, and what issues you're trying to mitigate really is the best uh, methodology when looking at solutions. But just like anything in life, they do have their own limitations. In a multi-vendor point solution approach, you do have separate devices which they tend to be expensive. You're picking best of breed products from the top organizations in the industry. 
And what comes with this is it becomes hard to use and hard to deploy because every organization has a different uh, user interface, a different architecture. And so there's a, high, there's a high total cost of ownership and a really high learning curve. So although this is great for larger organizations that have a pretty vast budget and a uh, large dedicated IT staff where you have an individual person focusing on each individual product, whether you have one person mitigating issues at the network perimeter and another employee uh, dealing with your email exchange and so on. So great solution for some organization, not always tailored for uh, education or organizations that they have one practice director that wears multiple hats. On the other side of the spectrum, you have the all-in-one solution. Now, nothing in life is impermeable to physics, even technology. You have one solution that's running multiple threat vectors all off of one central processing unit. And what occurs there is you experience bottlenecks and performance degradation. It's the equivalent of walking out to the parking lot, loading up your vehicle with an extra 1,000 pounds of weight, jumping on the freeway, and watching your gas mileage plummet. The more you tax one unit, the worse the performance will be. And what occurs is you incur seams where one vector meets the next. And we know most breaches occur when one vector is not actually running at optimal capacity because hackers in today's day and age go for the path of least resistance. All-in-one solutions tend to lack certain features and are constrained because everything is bundled into one unit. So although this is a great solution for some organizations, it does lack some of the control needed in education. When Barracuda looked at the two typical options, we wanted to create a solution that really pulled the best of both worlds. So we created an entire security portfolio that was unified, it was best in class, powerful, but also scalable. Most importantly, at Barracuda, we don't believe that for technology to be great, it needs to be expensive or hard to use. So we've developed an entire portfolio that really brings back the value to the end user, most of all reduces your learning curve. We achieve all of this through Barracuda's federated security architecture. That's all cloud-based, centrally managed. We use the Barracuda next generation firewalls to create a secure perimeter around your organization. Inside that perimeter, you have to focus on keeping your students safe. So you deploy Barracuda's web filter for web security. We know that a lot of advanced phishing attacks occur through spam and various other uh, entries that come into your email exchange. So it's important than ever to deploy a spam firewall that makes sure your organization is safe. And on the other side of the spectrum, looking at all the reports, all the latest and greatest hacks we've seen, web application security has become one of the most important aspects of your network topology. Also, one of the least protected, actually. So Barracuda's worked uh, diligently to create a web application firewall solution that NSS Labs recommended and actually scores off of the charts across all uh, practice testing and real life environments. And I think most of us work remotely at one point or another or bridge the gap between one uh, school office and the next. So creating secure tunneling and giving your employees the ability to access into your uh, organization's, your university's environment, you have to deploy a virtual private network that creates a secure connection. So Barracuda has created our VPN for this. As I mentioned earlier, threat vectors really have not evolved in the last few decades, but attack surfaces are constantly changing. Barracuda needed to create solutions that help your university, your uh, school districts manage this. So we've developed not only hardware, physical, on-premise uh, solutions, but also ones that are cloud-based and virtual because in today's day and age, we really do live in a hybrid environment. So whether you're looking at securing your physical, virtual, or cloud environment, we secure all threat vectors across all attack surfaces. So let's take a look at the Barracuda Advantage. 
I think in today's age, there's a lot of great organizations out there that do really make wonderful best of breed solutions. But I'll be completely honest with you. Grab best of breed vendors like Barracuda, Palo Alto, FireEye, F5. Take all of our products, put them on the table. What are you going to find out? We all work. It's important to move away from data sheet buying and focus on specific use cases and experience. So Barracuda really focused on this diligently when creating our entire product portfolio. We wanted to give control back to the end user, so we created simplified user interfaces across all of our devices. All of our devices look and feel the same. So, when you look at multiple Barracuda best of breed solutions, on the screen in front of you, on the left hand side is a Barracuda web filter. On the right hand side is the Barracuda firewall. If you notice, both interfaces are almost identical. Of course, they have varying tabs and features because they support a different threat vector, but once you've understood how to use one Barracuda solution, you understand not only how to manage the interface and implement granular controls and policies, but it's also the architecture is similar. So when you go to actually physically deploy this, your learning curve is cut in half, really letting you gain control of your network environment. At Barracuda, we really focus on simplified IT. We believe in 30-day free evaluations, no strings attached. Give us a call. Find out what solution you're specifically looking for. We'll send you one, whether it's a physical on-premise device or virtual one. Test it out. See how it works. Make sure that that specific size model set is really helping you achieve a total threat protection solution across all threat vectors and attack surfaces. But even more so, we believe in simple pricing models, 24-7 localized tech support. If you're in California and you call our tech support, you will get a localized person in Campbell. If you're in China, you will get a localized tech support person in China. We really believe in the whole user experience when you're looking at, you know, the tech support aspect, the deployment, or the day-to-day -day interface. Most of all, we wanted to really provide the most value, so we've created a four-year hardware refresh cycle. And what that means is keep your subscriptions up to date, and then every four years we will actually give you a brand new piece of hardware because we know that at the rate technology advances, it's imperative that you do have the greatest features and subsets based on the throughput required for today's dispersed environment. So every four years we will give you a brand new device, making Barracuda one of the last solutions you really need to uh, deploy. So I'm going to turn it back over to Jen, and she's going to go over, you know, education pricing programs that Barracuda's created to help really bring back the value to your districts. Thanks, Daniel. All right, so I'll just spend a moment here. So Barracuda does have some K-12 pricing programs, and these are items if you end up being interested in, you can, you know, talk to us directly about or to um, your local reseller. So we do have a standard educational discount available. And then we also have uh, EDU editions of our Barracuda web filter, and that's for our web filter models 8, 10, and above. And then there's also the education budget alignment program. So we know sometimes that your budgets don't line up to when you need to actually purchase, but you need to get that PO in. We do have a program that we can work with you on to, to help out there. And then lastly, E-rate. So we know that E-rate just closed, but when you start thinking about it, you know, again, for next year, we have uh, our web filter, our, or, sorry, does it qualify, our NG firewall, our firewall, and our um, web application firewall that are all part of uh, qualify for E-rate. So if there's interest there, just keep that in mind. So let's just, uh, you know, wrapping this up, talk about, you know, moving forward. And, you know, what are the next steps? So, you know, as far as the next steps go, you have, you know, clear set of challenges that you're going to have to deal with. So, you know, when we look at bandwidth and we talk about PARC and the online testing impact on your bandwidth, you know, what is it going to look like? You know, what's your, how is that going to impact your bandwidth in the next two to four years? You know, how does that uh, increase in going to impact your network? 
And then as, in regards to mobile devices, you know, knowing now that your network perimeter is borderless, how do those one-to-one -one initiatives end up impacting your network as well? And with 40% of all web traffic being SSL encrypted, does, how does that limit your visibility? You know, whether you have a firewall or a web filter, you know, is that providing you enough visibility and control over that SSL traffic? And then lastly, you know, resource, really resource constraints. You know, how do your vendors support you? You know, Daniel talked about, you know, Bar with Barracuda, the 24-7 you know, support. When you call, you get a person, you know, on the line, we don't have phone trees. You know, when you're thinking about, the, you're a small department, and you're thinking about these things, you really want to make sure that you get vendors that are going to be there to support you in, in case something, you know, happens or something goes down. And, you know, so at the end of the day, you know, when, when you're ready, you know, Barracuda is here for you. Again, we have those 30-day evals. We have online demos. You can call us or your reseller. You can also find more information about um, our, you know, about our K-12 solutions on our website in the, in the URLs listed here on the page. The other thing before you know, we close, and I know Andrew's going to come back and we're going to take some questions, is uh, Daniel and I, you know, want, we're putting our email addresses you know, out here. If you have questions, feel free to contact us directly. We'd be more than happy to get, we'll get back to you immediately or we'll put you in touch with the right person. So Andrew, I'm going to hand it back Correct. over at this point. And I want, I want to well, say thank, well, thank you, you to much. everyone for joining us. Okay, well, great. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer and Daniel, for sharing your insights about how schools and school districts can use some of the solutions from Maracuda Network. We have uh, about 14 minutes left uh, to take questions, and we do have a bunch of questions that we will need to try and get through in the next 14 minutes. So um, why don't we get on to that immediately? Um, the, the first question is, uh, which Barracuda products contain the sort of feature sets that would allow us to manage our BYOD policies, including the adoption of Google Chromebook? So through the Barracuda Next Generation Firewall and the web filter, you're able to uh, create granular policies for BYOD and your Chromebook, specifically dependent on what you're actually trying to achieve. So, these are, it's a great question, and it, because every topology varies and because every use case varies amongst every university and school, uh, I always typically like to take this a little offline. As Jen mentioned, our uh, emails are listed out there. Feel free to email me because I would hate to provide you an answer and, without getting a full understanding of what your uh, district or your school is trying to actually achieve. So. Again, you could do it through both of our best of breed solutions, whether you're talking about the Barracuda web filter or the next generation firewall. It would just, uh, I would need more information to understand specifically what you're trying to do. Okay, well, terrific. Well, thank you for that. Uh, so if anyone has anything further that they want to follow up on that particular topic, just, just contact uh, Daniel directly, please. Uh, let's turn to another question, which is, and, and you touched on this briefly uh, in your presentation. Um, can you speak more about the solutions that you have available to help schools manage e-discovery requirements? Yes, sure. So um, the solution is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's the, um, the Barracuda Message Archiver. And so the archiver is, you know, going to allow for sophisticated, you know, search and export, export of um, emails, the social media messages, and that's, you know, really where it's going to be helpful if something comes up such as cyberbullying, and you'll be able to go quickly access that information and then have it available for anything related to e-discovery, and if. Again, kind of going back to you know what Daniel said, if there's specific information that someone's looking for, just email us and we'll um, put you in touch with our product expert and we can you know get you an online demo or an eval. Okay. All right. And then uh, again, something that you you mentioned uh, during the presentation. 
Uh, could you tell uh, some of the audience, some of the audience who asked how they would sign up for that Barracuda mobile device manager? Yes, I can answer that. Um, so the quickest way to get access to the mobile device manager for sign up is you need to go onto our website and you can visit. We actually have um, two places that uh, you can access uh, to get there. One is um, our mobile device manager uh, landing page, which is barracuda.com forward slash mobile device manager. Or you can go to our K-12 page, which is at barracuda.com slash K-12. And you'll find a, a link there, a button, that will take you directly to um, what's called Barracuda Cloud Control. And it'll ask you, it'll look for you, it'll know you don't have an account. And it'll ask you to create an account and then once you create an account, it's pretty simple. I think it's just based on your name, company name, maybe email. It will give in, you'll get inside the tool and it will give you full directions on how you can configure your profile and enroll all your devices. It's um, pretty detailed once you're inside um, of the portal. Okay. All right, thanks. Well, I'm good. there's another question from the audience that I uh, maybe might be split into two parts. It, it's talking about uh, a training, and the question is, do you offer professional development seminars? And I just want to expand on that. It, it, can you talk a little bit about the training that would be available to the IT staff in the district? And then a follow-up to that would be, does the faculty, do teachers and so on, have any need for professional development to uh, to have these uh, Barracuda products uh, in, in their district, or is that all behind the scenes and something they don't have to worry about? And that's a great question. So yes, Barracuda does offer training. We have our own Barracuda University where we, you can join us at one of our localized centers, or depending on what your need is, uh, we can create an option where we will come directly to you train on specific vectors, technology, topology, uh, whatever the case is, whether you're looking at a field deployment standpoint, a management aspect, we have classes that range all the way from entry level to uh, engineering. Right. Uh, okay, and, and then, then the, sorry, keep going, sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt. And then uh, regarding uh, your uh, second part of the question was, uh, do uh, you know, teachers and faculty need to be trained on specific you know, products to secure network threat vectors? The beauty of it is, is they don't. Usually this occurs always at the IT aspect of it. These policies are created with input from uh, the school boards and the district based on what they want to limit uh, what they want to allow. Uh, can we do specific training to create awareness uh, at a teacher level? Yes, of course, that's no problem. From a device management aspect, no, there would be no need for it. Our devices and solutions are created to simplify IT so you could manage an entire total threat protection solution uh, being the guy that wears multiple hats and in my opinion, the best security policies are the ones that you essentially set and forget without sounding too cliche. Okay, so that's, that's terrific. All right, and uh, I'll throw one more question at you here. Is, is you talked about uh, districts and schools being able to get a 30-day a evaluation. How do schools go about getting that uh, free 30-day evaluation uh, unit? What do they have to do? That's a great question. So you have two options. Either feel free to reach out to Jennifer and myself, and we'll uh, pave the way and guide you through that process and get you set up with somebody that can, first of all, help you determine specifically what size, what model, what you're doing in your environment to give you the best solution that you need. Uh, no sales gimmicks, just uh, strictly to get an understanding of what your uh, organization, your school district needs. The other option is to go to barracuda.com forward slash evaluations. You can take a look at our entire product portfolio and request an evaluation. We will still reach out to you to get a better understanding to make sure that you are deploying the right solution for the right designated vector. 
So when you look at whether you need a web filter to keep your students safe or a web application firewall uh, to keep your web applications and environments safe, if you don't know, we have no problem guiding you into what specific product will help you achieve those granular controls. Okay, thank you. And just to add, well, and I was just going to add to that, and you can always go on our website, and under every product, you'll always see the button there for the free 30-day eval, or you'll find it on our purchasing page. So it's always accessible if you if you want to, you know, go off on your own. But you know, like Daniel said, feel free to reach out to us, and we'll we'll take care of you. All right, and. Uh, Daniel, let me just ask you one, one question I had for myself, which is uh, early on in your presentation, you, you had highlighted how web applications had, had uh, become a major uh, threat, uh, potential threat, and you, you uh, compared with some of the other issues that were out there. If you look down the road, are there any other emerging threats that schools should be aware of that, that you're seeing sort of tracking and it's something that might be developing down the road? That's a great question. So the beauty and the downside of the environment we live in is the threat landscape's constantly evolving, and this is why we say you need to focus on the threat vector. I'll be completely honest with you. There's no way to prevent being attacked, but there is, to there is the ability to mitigate the fallout of it. So as I mentioned, in previous years, point-of-sale intrusions were the number one breach, which in theory do not affect most schools. But with the adoption of web applications, that vector had changed to web application security. With every new year, hackers become smart and they go after the easiest breach, the easiest way to steal data. So it's constantly evolving. Now, people believe that the threats have molded into something incredibly sophisticated, but if you look at the patterns that have attacked some of the largest organizations, whether you're looking at the recent ones of Anthem, Target, Sony, or Microsoft, those attacks were very rudimentary. They used DDoS attacks, denial of service attacks at a perfect timing given Christmas Day for Microsoft and Sony, knowing there would be an advanced deployment of Sony PlayStations and Xboxes. Perfect time to flood the gates of a network and to create downtime. So that question, it's a, the solution is focusing on the threat vectors because it allows you to mitigate whatever environment comes up, whether it's a hole in the code or an actual breach. If you have a proper solution in place for that vector, you will be able to mitigate it using Barracuda's threat intelligence system. And I would love to tell you what next year will bring, but unfortunately for us, we're always in an uphill battle. For trusted advisors, for security firms, we spend every day, every hour thinking of a million ways to keep our users, our children, our devices, organizations, and data safe. Unfortunately for us, hackers really only have to come up with one way to bypass those measures, and it's usually done with the one that has the least attention on it. Okay. Well, well, thank you for clarifying that for me. Uh, that was very useful. Uh, we're going to, you know, if you, you know, as 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 I said earlier on in the in the presentation, um, you're going to be receiving an email from us in the next couple of days. It's going to have a, a, a link to the recording as well as the ability to download the slides. And at any time between then and now, as you think about the presentation you heard today, um, if you have additional questions for Jennifer or Daniel, just please contact them directly at the uh, email addresses that you see on the screen in front of you. Uh, other than that, we have come very close to the end of our hour, so I'm going to as we wrap up, I want to thank Jennifer and Daniel for uh, really some excellent presentations. And I'd also like to thank Barracuda Networks for its support. And uh, once again, look for that email in a couple of days uh, with that link to the recording and the ability to download the slide. But uh, thank you all so much for attending today. Uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, this concludes today's webcast. Goodbye. Great. Thanks so much, everybody, for joining us. Thank you.